Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you for coming. Again, we're continuing with the lecture on the Passover Haggadah. And uh, we're now at the making uh, the Kiddush this year. Um, we do begin with Friday night, so therefore we'll, we will begin with the prayer that's said every Friday night. And then we'll go on to the special part of Kiddush that is done for the holiday. So we begin with the words Yom Hashishi, um, that the, of the sixth day of creation, and uh, that God for, for that finished off the creation of the heavens and the earth and all of the host. Now, what's interesting is we make Kiddush every Shabbos and Yontif holiday. What's the difference on Pesach? Same old, same old. So there are major differences. Number one is it must be made on wine. It cannot be made on bread or matzvah. The Shulchan Aruch says that a person, especially in times of, of need, getting kosher wine was not always available or very expensive. So you can make Kiddush on bread uh, or on matzah, depending upon whichever. But on Pas Pesach, on Passover, you can only make it on wine. Uh, also, everyone must drink at least two ounces of wine, again, which is different. Uh, on a regular Shabbos, if someone decides they don't want to drink, they really don't have to. It's more of a custom. And, uh, and just having a small sip is also enough. Whereas on um, Pesach, on the night of, at the Seder, everyone should have their own cup and everyone should drink at least two ounces, again, reclining when they drink it. Also, Kiddush can only be made after nightfall. Whereas on a regular Shabbos, we can start with what's called the plog, which I'm not going to get into, but it's a little bit earlier at that time, a little bit before nightfall. So those are some of the differences. Now, um, in the Kiddush, it talks about, again, Kivoshivas Mikomalakto, the reason we make Kiddush, God rested from all his work. Again, when we say that God rested, uh, it's not like God was tired. Um, the truth of the matter is we can kind of compare this world uh, it's a question whether we exist at all and whether we really only exist in the mind of God. It's kind of a dream. Uh, when you dream, you create a world. No effort on your part. It's not like you get tired because you had a big dream. Um, so if we exist in the mind of God and actually all, all that exists is God, so really he would have created the world with very little effort whatsoever. So there was no need to, for him to rest, so to speak. What we mean by Shabbos is that God stopped creating. And that's why that's why we, why we do no creative acts on Shabbos. And that's the idea. It's not a matter of work. You can pick up a couch and move it from one end of the room to the other. Uh, you can't flip a light switch, which takes no effort whatsoever. The creative act. And now for the holiday in the second paragraph of the of the Kiddush, we call it Moadim Lasimcha Chagim is Madam the holidays for joy and in the and the Chagim and the festivals, a time of rejoicing. Now, do the words mean that we rest only on Shabbos and that we are happy only on festivals? Again, because we mentioned one, one in one place and one in the other. So the attribute of rest which God put into the world on the seventh day of creation is what follows, means rest to be enjoyed during the other days of the week as well. And the happiness inherent in the holidays puts happiness into the rest of the year based on his Fasemis. So that's the idea, not just for them. And again, because all of our blessings, we believe, come from the Shabbos and come from the previous week and also from the holidays. They all come together to give us this joy. Now we call it again Chagamatzos. Torah calls the holiday Chagamatzos, and we call it Pesach, as we mentioned in one of the earlier uh, lectures. God calls it the festival of matzahs to praise the nation of Israel for leaving Egypt, with Egypt without any provisions, only with the dough that they had carried with them. And we praise God for the passing over our houses and saving us from the killing of the firstborn, which is interesting. That was the only one of the ten plagues that we needed protection from. All the other nine were really um, more of a instruction to the Egyptians to show them when they asked who was God, to show that. But the killing of the firstborn, again, concerned both the Jews and, and the Egyptians because they were both idol worshippers and they were both culpable of being punished for the, for the sin. So therefore they needed protection, which they did not need for the other ones. Now, on um, this, shop, this uh, Pesach, this Passover, 
Uh, it's on Friday and Saturday night, so we will be doing Havdalah on the second night. Now, Rav Tzadok Cohen raises the following question about Havdalah. Again, Havdalah is the prayer that we say that separates between that which is the mundane, the maholi to the mundane. Havdalah means to, Havdalah means to separate. So in a safer pre-tzedek, he says, why do we incorporate wine as part of the Havdalah? So he says, wine symbolizes rejoicing, as it says in Tehillim, that wine makes man's heart joyful. So when a person spends six days involved in everyday affairs, his powers of discernment are weakened. Man's involvement in the mundane world makes it difficult for him to discern between the Yisrael, the Amim, between the Jewish people and other nations, between the words ben yom ashfi the sheish me'amaisa, between the seventh day and the six days of work, and ben or lechoshech, between light and darkness. Experiencing Shabbos restores a person's power of discernment. Therefore, we rejoice on the Matzoi Shabbos on Saturday night and drink wine as part of the Havdalah, based on Yitzchok Sender. And again, there's also the wine, the the um, flame, the fire that we also make a blessing on um, because again the fire was introduced into the world on Saturday night uh, and since we celebrate Shabbos as the celebration of the six days of creation and since man was not introduced to fire until Saturday night, in fact it's the only one of the prohibitive acts on Shabbos that is mentioned in the Torah so that's part of it and we also on um, when it's after a, a holiday uh, and it's Shabbos goes into another how we don't smell psalmim. We don't have smelling salts, so to speak. On a weekday we do, again, because we believe we have what's called the Shami Yaseir, an extra soul, that when it leaves, that we are uh, need to be need to uh, be reawakened, so to speak, um, like resuscitated, like a person who is, uh, has passed out in a spiritual sense. And again, all, all of the sanctity, Kedusha, sanctification enters through the nostrils. It says when man was created, Yipak Biapa Ruachayim. When man was created, that God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And if you look at your nose, it's shaped like an upside down shin, which is also on our tefillin. Again, in the Atbash, which we're not going to get into, the numerical value of the shin is 300, which is the same as God's name of mercy, the Yud Ke Vavke in the Atbash. Um, so all of these things, and also the fact that when man ate from the tree of knowledge, he tainted four of the senses that we have, but not the sense of smell. So the sense of smell remains pristine, and that's one of the reasons why we have the, sm the smelling salt, so to speak, at the end of Shabbos when we smell something. Um, now, the Seder continues um, with the rochats, which is where we wash our hands. Again, there's no blessing made. Now, why wash our hands now? And just like a Kohen before doing any service was wash his hands. This was part of the service, in addition to going to a mikvah, to a ritualarium, where he would, where he would uh, dunk his whole body before he would do any act. He would wash his hands and his feet. We see today that the Muslims still do that. Um, and again, um, this is something that was done. Again, the two external parts of the body that are not covered by the clothes of the Kohen. So again, they needed sanctification. He would wash his hands and his feet uh, before any ritual. Also, whenever one would eat food that was dipped in liquid, he would make sure his hands were pure. Now, today we don't deal with purification. We don't have a temple, so it's not quite an issue. But in olden times, it was a big issue. People wanted to remain spiritually pure. And uh, again, when you, whenever something is wet, it becomes a conduit of impurity. So therefore, we would make sure that when you're going to dip something, and we're about to dip the vegetable into salt water. So again, so to commemorate that, we wash our hands without a blessing. Also, this is done to arouse the curiosity of children. Since we wash our hands here without a blessing, and the child is used to seeing washing, but really not without a blessing. So now it's unusual, and again, the whole Seder, Seder is geared towards a child asking questions. Now, next part of karpas, of dipping the vegetable, a potato, celery, whatever one might use, into salt water. Why dip it in salt water? So the word karpas can be broken up into two words, samach perach. 
that six, the stomach stands for 60 or 600,000 of the nation Israel, were forced into hard labor. And again, the salt water alludes to tears. Also, uh, that being slaves, they did not eat meat and were forced to eat only vegetables. Also, to arouse one's appetite for the matzah. And also, there is a therapeutic vegetable that's called karpas. Uh, celery that the nation of Israel used to eat after their heavy toil. Now, there's also an allusion to the cloak of Yosef that the brothers dipped in the goat's blood before they gave their cloak, the cloak to their father when they sold Yosef to uh, make their father believe that Yosef had been torn apart by a wild animal. Um, now, the, the, the vegetable grows in the, in the earth until it appears on the holy Seder table of a Jewish family. And so too God in his mercy can raise us from the depths of exile, the earth, in a and to the time of Mashiach in the, in, the, in the blink of an eye. Now, when we make the blessing here, we have in mind the uh, mor that we're going to have later on in the service of the Seder. Now the question is, why do we have in mind with the mor, with this blessing, for the when we make the uh, blessing on Bura Priyam Dhamma, something that grows from the ground, to include that mor. So some say that since the mor is bitter, in reality it does not require a blessing at all because it's something that we really wouldn't eat by itself, so it's, we go under the uh, category of not edible. Also others say that since the mor is eaten after the matzah, it doesn't require another blessing. It really becomes part of the meal, so one would have a question on it. Also, it's not eaten to satisfy hunger. So because of all these reasons, there's a real question as to whether any blessing should be made. So to, to take care of both of those opinions, of those would say that you do or you don't need to make a blessing, we have in mind with the vegetable, the potato, or the celery that we're dipping here, which we definitely would need a blessing for it's before the meal. So therefore, it would encompass both. With that, we move on to the next part of the um, Seder, which is called the Yachatz, which is the breaking of the middle matzah. Um, there are three matzahs on the plate, which we call the Kohen, the Levi, and Yisrael matzahs of the three. And we take the middle matzah, the Levi matzah, and we break it in two. And uh, the one part that we keep, that we break, the bigger part is used for the Afikoman. And the smaller part we'll use for the korak, for the sandwich uh, at the Zechel, for Hillel, that Hillel used to make a sandwich of the mar with, with the uh, Korban Pesach. Now, there are those who, um, in accordance with the biblical verse recounting Israel left Egypt, they put the matzah on their shoulders, again, Sephardim do this, and they say, but the Hilo Yatsanu Mimitzrayim, in haste we went out of Egypt that they didn't have a chance to let their, their dough rise, and therefore they put it on their shoulders leaving. Now, yachatz, the matzah, is broken, since a slave would never eat a whole matzah. He would hoard part of it for a later meal, when he might not have any other food, based on Rabbi high Gon. Um, my stepfather was a uh, survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. He was in concentration camps for five years. And I remember him telling me different people would have um, different customs, different procedure when they would receive their ration of bread when they were in the concentration camps. And he said, you know, some people would eat it right away. I guess they were, they were all hungry. It's not like they were fed for satiety. Uh, what he would do is he would put the, matzo, pardon me, put the bread into his pocket and take out crumbs and just a little bit at a time. And he said just the thought of knowing that he had some bread in his pocket gave him strength. So again, we can see the same concept over here of saving part of the matzah that a poor person might do. Uh, also that uh, we know that God cut the years of slavery in half. They were supposed to be in Egypt for 400 years. They were only there for 210, again, an allusion to that. It's also an allusion to the Jews and the splitting of the Red Sea. Also, by breaking the matzah in two, there are now four pieces of matzah. Again, as we mentioned uh, before, the idea of four in the Seder. Also, all holidays are supposed to be celebrated half for God and half for, for people. So again, this idea of cutting it in half. Also, the middle matzah is broken in half since the tribe of Levi 
which is that that matzah is, I mentioned, the middle matzah, consisted of Levim, late Levites, and Kohanim, priests. So again, breaking it in half. Also, remembrance of what we call the Brit Ben Habtarim, of the covenant of the halves when Abraham uh, had this, his covenant with God where he walked through the animals that were cut in half, which really was the time when he was told that his children would be enslaved for 430 years. Now, the larger piece is saved for the Afikoman because we believe that the miracles of the Messiah will bring will even be greater than those that were done in Egypt. Also, it was interesting, we hide the matzah to say that the time of the Messiah's coming is hidden from us. Also, the law that the meal uh, shall follow Kiddush, but here we break the matzah to connect the elaboration of the story with the meal, again, based on Shlomo Zalman. Um, the, um, what's interesting is that there is a custom of having the children steal the matzah, uh, the afikoma. Now the question is, why would we, there be a custom for that to happen? And the answer given so that the children should stay up for most of the Seder. After all, they're usually they're given some kind of bribe for giving back the afikoma. So it's an exciting time for them to find out what they can get. Also, to hint to the fact that no dog barked on that night. Uh, that was one of the miracles the dogs were rewarded to get the carcasses of animals for not barking on the night that the Jews left Egypt uh, so that they could now steal. Because since the dog is a form of protection from thieves by being somewhat of an alarm system, so now the fact that they're able to steal the afikoma is because no dog barked, an allusion to that. Also, this was the night of that Yaakovino stole the blessings from Ace of his brother, based on base Mordechai. Also, that it was decreed in heaven that you should that if you should be robbed by someone this year, this be, should be considered the robbery. So this should be in lieu of any difficulty that you might have in that in that um, area. Now. With that, we now enter the body of the Haggadah, which is called Magid. Magid, again, is a story. Now, the broken matzo, before we get into that, is lifted by the head of the household. And uh, he's going to call out these first words of the uh, Magid, of the story, with Halak Ma'anya. This is the bread of affliction. Now, we lift the matzo to commemorate how the Kohen, the priest, lifted what we call the Lechem upon him the showbreads that were kept on the golden table in the holy temple for all of the nation Israel to see. And he said, see how beloved you are before God, based on Yitzchak Sender, because you could see the steam coming off of the bread. The bread was there for a week, and yet it was still fresh. So the great miracle of showing that God's presence was in the holy temple. So with Magid, um, there are different questions that are asked. One of them is, why is there no blessing when we begin the, this part of the, of the, uh, the Haggadah? The Haggadah begins with the Kiddush, and that states that the festival was given by God. Zechel Etzias Mitzrayim, as a remembrance of the going out of Egypt, which constitutes a blessing um, based on the uh, heritage. Al Sfasema says no blessing is necessary for performance of a mitzvah that was ordained by simple logic and respect for decency such as honoring parents, and so to the exodus, the going out of Egypt, simple decency would dictate that we express our gratitude, even if we had not been commanded to do so, again, by the Book of Heritage. Also, at the time of the Seder, we are like Gerim, like converts, and we cannot pronounce a blessing yet, based on the Psalm Seifer, because we have not yet been converted. Also, blessings are made only, as we know, the Jews actually became Jews at Mount Sinai 50 days later. Also, blessings are made only, uh, made only over commandments, which have a definite re requirements and limits. And because commandments such as charity, prayer, and honoring parents have no defined limits, no blessing is possible based on a rush. The Agoda is itself really a form of divine praise, and therefore there's really no need for a blessing based on the Elias uh, Haggadah. Also, the, the time Haggadah is not a duty by itself, but an outgrowth of a practical mitzvah of the Seder, night. Uh, it, is, it is when we, we are, are asked the reason for them. 
that we must respond by explaining about the redemption from Egypt based on the lives. Again, when your child asks to be got it to, then you'll tell them, so that becomes the point as well. Now, the Torah commands us to remember the Exodus every day. So what is so unique about this commandment on the night of Pesach is one of the six remembrance we say every day and also in the Shema. If the answer is on the other nights, the obligation is only to mention the Exodus. But on Pesach, on Passover, the entire narrative must be recited and discussed at length. As it states in the Haggadah, the more one tells about the exodus from Egypt, the more praiseworthy he is, based on the Book of Heritage. Also, thinking is not enough. It must be articulated. You can't just have thoughts. And also, even if you're alone, the person finds himself traveling and he's by himself, he has to actually say the words. He can't just think them. He has to ask himself the questions and answer. Now, again, questions and answers are the format. We must feel that we must feel and say that we ourselves have been liberated, liberated from Egypt today, and uh, just like we'll see in the Manishtana, when it talks about matzah and mora, we do this when there's matzah and mora before us. Now, the the the, the next paragraph begins with halak ma'anya. This is the bread of affliction. Uh, that our forefathers ate in the land of Mitzrayim, anyone who was called Difkan Yetzirah, anyone who was uh, hungry, uh, let him come and eat, and whoever is needy, let him come and celebrate Pesach. Now we are here, next year we'll be in the land of Israel, now we are slaves, next year we'll be free men. Now the word ha has an American value of six, and lach ma'anya is the, is the um, has a bread of affliction, has an American value of 210. And again, Ha six alludes to the six mitzvahs, the six commandments that a person fulfills when he gives charity. So there's an illusion that connects that again to this bread of affliction that they concerning the 210 years that they were in Egypt. Now, what's interesting is is that this prayer, this beginning statement of, of prayer graph, is said in Aramaic. So the question becomes, why not in Hebrew? The answer given, since God is personally attending our seder. We pray to him and do not need angels because there is a belief that angels, even though they understand quite a bit, do not understand Aramaic. So therefore, when we say something like the Kaddish, it goes directly to God himself and not towards the angels. So therefore, we say the prayer in Aramaic, so to speak, a personal conversation with our Father in heaven. Also, uh, this was formulated by the men of the Great Assembly after the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile when they were in Babylon where they spoke Aramaic for 70 years. And this was the language of the day that they spoke, Basin of Barbanel. Um, also, only those who registered for the Corbin Pesach, for the Paschal offering, could join the meal. So, this, so, so therefore it was too late to invite the poor. And this is why we lament, but in the end, uh, it, it ends with... Uh, next year in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in the hope that next year will be different. Also so that the women and children and uh, simple people would be able to understand the beginning of the Haggadah and then pay attention again and question the rest based on the Maharal of Prague. Now, the question becomes, why so much emphasis on the poor on Pesach? Um, which we see is not the case on Shvuot and on Sukkot. The answer given is because the other two Chagim, which we call the three festivals, Pesach being the first, though they are, they can also commemorate the exodus from Egypt, have other themes that they bear. Shvuot, the giving of the Torah. Sukkot, the protection that God gave us while we are in the desert with the clouds of glory. But Pesach is Zaman Cherusenu, the time of our freedom, a time when we were freed from poverty and oppression. And so we put our special emphasis on the poor and needy who need our assistance, based on Rizal Mishrutkin. Also, this is not like the meal of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, which the Gemara says brought about the destruction of the temple. Very quickly, Kamsa, uh, there were two men called Kamsa and Bam Bar Kamsa, and this person made a party and he invited his friend Kamsa to the party. And instead, his uh, messenger took the invitation to his enemy, Bar Kamsa. And in the middle of the meal, Bar Kamsa was sitting at one of the tables. And when the host saw that Bar Kamsa was there, he told him to get up and leave. 
and Bar Kamsa uh, was embarrassed at being asked to leave, and he told the host that he would gladly pay for his meal if he let him stay. The host told him to leave. He said he would pay for half of the affair, and the host still told him to leave. He then told him he would pay for the whole affair, and he had him thrown out anyways. The man was very angry, and he went to Rome, and he told the Caesar that the Jews were planning a revolt. Caesar didn't believe him, and he said, to prove it, send me with a sacrifice, and you'll see they won't bring your sacrifice up in their temple because they no longer have any respect for you, and they will, are planning this revolt. And with the man, the Caesar gave him a sheep to take with him for a sacrifice that was perfect, and the man on the way to Rome may have put a blemish in the animal, just put a slit on its eyelid, which was not a, a blemish for an idol, but would have been for the temple. And when he brought it to the temple, they... The rabbis had a great debate because they knew what his purpose was. So they said, most of them said that they should bring it anyways, even though it was blemished. And one of them said that people will say you can bring a blemished animal. So they said, good, what we'll do is kill Bar Kamsa because he's going to go back to Rome. And then they said, well, then somebody will say that if someone brings a blemished animal, you kill him. So they did nothing. Bar Kamsa went back to Rome. And that brought about the destruction. And again, sin us him, baseless hatred. And again, today, what we're trying to overcome and have avaschinim, baseless love, and that's part of the Seder, to show love to people, all people, and to invite them to the Seder. Um, another thing is because there is an obligation to eat matzah, and we want to be sure that everyone, because then it says, we always say all poor people should come and eat. Why do we say that? And we say that because, again, there is a Torah obligation to eat matzah, and we want to be sure that everyone fulfills this obligation based on Shpuli Leket. Now, also since there is so much to prepare and buy for Pesach, we are concerned that many people, especially poor people, will not be able to afford to buy all of their provisions for the Seder. And again, that's one of the reasons why we invite them. Also, that one must eat the Paschal offering when he is full, but not sated. And he must still feel a need for some more food to eat. The, the Paschal offering, and again, this is why we deal with this concept of being hungry, so to speak. Now, why is it called, again, the, the bread of affliction? Because it's lechem bread that we onye, we recite many things. So the word, again, is used as something we talk over. Um, based on the Gemara Mesachim. Also, the Egyptians never gave their Jewish slaves enough time to let their dough rise. So anav, it was an affliction. Also, it is eaten like an ani, like a poor person, when, he, when we break the middle matzah. Also, this, is, this, uh, this was one-tenth of an ephah in the amount that was there, the same amount that a Jew would bring when bringing a mincha, a meal offering sacrifice, in the temple based in the barbanel. Now, matzah is made a, in a poor fashion, just flour and water, and reminds us of the slavery and how the nation of Israel lived on small rations. Also, we know that matzah is hard to digest. We can all testify to that. And therefore, masters would be able to give their slaves less to eat, since it would, they would retain it in their system longer. Also, this is that, uh, that it is the matzah, the mitzvah of tzedakah. Okay, matzah and mitzvah are the same word. And that will bring about the era of Mashiach. And again, there's a uh, allusion to that based on the Danya uh, and Elias uh, Haggadah. Now, there are three names, for, again, for it. Uh, matzah, bread of poverty, lachmanya, the bread of affliction, and the bread upon which many answers are said. Now, there are two invitations. The first is for the poor who need food, and the second is for the lonely who are in need of social and emotional nourishment. Uh, tzedakah has six mitzvahs, but showing kindness to uh, any individual, even a poor person, has 11. And uh, so again, everyone can be in need, even a rich person, and especially when he travels. So 6 and 11 of mitzvah, of tzedakah, and of kindness is 17, which is the, the matri of the word tov, which is good, which is what we, again, camaraderie and avas uh, skinam of loving people just to love them. Also, there's 6 and 11. 6 and 11 together is the gematria of the word Torah, 611 mitzvahs. The first two we receive from God. 611 Torah we serve from Moshe, which is the basis of 
uh, Olam Chesed Yibana, the world was created for kindness. Now the Medrash Eicha states that there are two reasons why we are still in the Galut. We have neglected to eat matzah, lechem ani, poor man's bread. And we have neglected to help the poor, the ani, the poor man himself. The Chida explains that at the Seder we attempt to remedy both of them at the same time. We display the matzah and invite the poor. Um, I think we'll, I guess we'll have to stop here and we'll continue with why it says Lashana Haba in Hebrew and not in Aramaic the next time we get together. Thank you very much. Have a great Shabbos.